I want to welcome every single one of you here in this, this sanctuary and those of you who are watching us on YouTube. I want to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our God. Today is Memorial Day Sunday. Tomorrow is the actual Memorial Day. And for those of you who are not uh, familiar with our church, we always have a, a parade that lands on our church green. So those of you who um, are on YouTube, um, if you can pray, and I know, you're, well, I'll be praying after it already happened. Well, you know what? God can see into the future. And so even future prayers can affect the past. I believe that because our God is outside of time. Okay? We are the ones that are captives to time. And so if you would just pray that, that this church would just show the love of Jesus Christ. And uh, without any further ado, my, the title of my message today is Memorial Day, Midterms, and Madness in America. <laughs> Memorial Day, midterms, and madness in America. We are here on this Sunday to honor the, the dead who died for us, to give us this freedom, to, to give Americans the right to assemble, the right to, to, to freedom of speech, the right to own and bear arms, our Fourth Amendment right, protecting us from illegal search and seizure. And if you know anything about what's going on in the political spectrum today, there has been violation of all of those amendments by certain people who think that they're above the Constitution, above the laws of the land, and above God himself. We have a banner. It says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17. If we in America want to be truly free, we need to live in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We need to walk in the presence of Almighty God. We need to operate our lives in the love Amen. of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to say I fall woefully short of this. I can do better. I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus immensely. But I know I, know I could love him more. I know I could walk in His Spirit more. And so, it's appropriate that we talk about Memorial Day, midterms, and madness in America. I'd like to read from the Gospel of John. John 15, 13, it says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Veterans who have died in wars of the past did that for us. They loved us and they laid their lives. But you know what? The ultimate veteran is Jesus Christ. Jesus yes. laid down his life, not just for one country, but for the entire human race from the days of Adam until the very last child born in the millennial kingdom. Jesus showed his love to us. And if you read further on in that passage, we're not going to read further on, but just to let you know, Jesus then turns to his disciples and he says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. Because a friend knows what another friend is doing. And guess what? We, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are the friends of God. And because we are God's friends, God has shown us exactly how the human race is going to pan out. We don't need to fear. We've got our blessed hope, and we got the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. We got the new heaven and the new earth and glorified bodies and eternal fellowship and eternal life. And God is in control of it all. Even though in America we celebrate Memorial Day, midterms, and madness. I like to read one other verse before we jump into the sermon as a whole. Psalm 33, 12 says this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as, in, as his own inheritance. Do you realize that if you are a born-again Christian, you are the inheritance of Jesus Christ. Amen. You belong to him. In fact, you are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And we want our country to be a country that says yes, the God of Abraham, 
Isaac and Jacob, the God of the Bible, is the God of the United States of America. We want that for America. I hope you pray for that for America, because there are a lot of Americans who don't want that. But there are a lot of Americans who do. And, and here's a little secret, guys. The Americans who do love Jesus Christ and who do want Jesus to be the God of this country are the largest voting block of people in the country. There is no reason why we shouldn't have a righteous country. There really is no reason. You know, they, you know they have a saying, where, where does the gorilla in the forest, where does the gorilla decide to lay down? Anywhere he wants. Because he's a gorilla. There's another saying, what can 35 million born-again Christians have in America? Anything we want, if we would yet be unified in our prayers for this country. I don't care what political party you come from. And I don't care if you think, you know, think different of that. The fact of the matter is, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And if you're a born-again Christian, that's something you should be praying for your country. And you know what? People in other countries should be praying that for their country. This isn't a uniquely American thing. This could be a worldwide thing, and it would be a much better world Amen. if we had that yes. happening all across the globe. So you say, what is God's role in America. Well, my thesis is this. God desires that all men to be saved through the knowledge of the truth. To put it succinctly, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. Amen. America, yes. you want heaven? You want eternal life? You want peace? You want to meet God in a proper way? you got to go through Jesus Christ. And so there is no one passage on this. We're going to hop around in our Bibles. So I hope you brought your Bibles with you because we're going to be, hit, we're going to be hitting some, some different spots. My three points are this. What is God's role in America? What is the church's role in America? And what is the ruler's role in America? God's role in America, the church's role in America, and the rulers, their role in America. Well, let's take a look at God's role in America first, shall we? And turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. If there was ever a man who walked closely with God, it was Daniel. In fact, in Daniel chapter 9, Gabriel says to Daniel, You are most beloved. And because of that phrase, theologians have nicknamed Daniel the Beloved Prophet. There was another man who was called Beloved. His name was the Apostle John. And because of that, theologians have nicknamed the Apostle John the Beloved Apostle. And I point your attention to this fact. Who wrote the apocalyptic book of the Old Testament? Daniel. Who wrote the apocalyptic book, not of just the New Testament, but of the entire Bible? John. Abraham was the only person in the Old Testament called the friend of God. Now, it doesn't mean that God only had one friend. That's not what I'm talking It's just the title that God gave Abraham. And because God, Abraham was God's friend, when the Lord was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he spoke to his two angels. He said, uh, Abraham's my friend. Shall I not tell him what I'm going to do? And so Ab Ab Abraham is told what God is going to do so that Abraham then would turn and intercede and pray for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and barter for the safety of those five cities. Of course, unfortunately, there wasn't enough righteous people in those five cities that made up over five million people in order for God to redeem it. And God burned the place to the ground. I don't know about you, but I don't want America burned to the ground. So we need to intercede. But not only that, we just saw in John 15 that we, born-again Christians, are the friends of God. There's something about being God's friend that we can know His role in America and in our own lives. So in Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, this is what Daniel declares about God and His role in the nations. 
This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will and sets it over the lowest of men. It's God who establishes leaders. President Donald Trump was prophesied. That's right. American prophets prophesied that he would be the president of the United States of America. Amen. And the conventional wisdom in 2016, if you talked with the pundits, you talked with the Republicans, you talked with the Democrats, they all said Hillary Clinton is a shoe in But God said, no, she is not my anointed one. Donald Trump is. God spoke to me prophetically about that because I was looking to a different person. I wanted Ted Cruz to be president of the United States. And God said, no. Wow. Donald Trump. And I'm like, Donald Trump? Are you kidding me? And then God said, he will be your Nebuchadnezzar. And I remember what God said about Nebuchadnezzar. When Jeremiah the prophet was, was languishing over the nation of Israel, God told Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar is my anointed, serve him. And that was Jeremiah's message to, to Judah. Serve Nebuchadnezzar. You'll stay in your land. Your city will prosper. You will be blessed. But the people of Judah didn't listen. They listened to the false prophets who came. In. Now, put yourself in the Jews' place. Okay, a pagan non-believer is the Lord's anointed? Where are you nuts, Jeremiah? Did you, did you smoke some mushrooms or something? And I'm not the only one that God echoed that. There was another lady that operated in the prophetic, and God told her the exact same thing. How do I know? Because when I shared that with a friend of mine, she shared that, oh, that, that person said the same thing, that God said the same thing to them. Confirmation. It was confirmation. And, and I urge you to go on True News and look up Mark Taylor's prophecy over President Donald Trump. It will blow your mind because it is coming together in spades every day. Part of it. In fact, Mark thought that President Trump would be running for president in 2012. And that's when God spoke in 2011 to this prophet. But God said, no, my people weren't ready for it. But in 2016, God's people were ready to see God's role in the country. And do you realize in 2016, it was one of the highest percentages of evangelical Christians voting since the 80s. Since Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. I, again, to tell you, what can 35 million born-again Americans have? Uh, voters? Anything they want. Anything they want. In fact, when the Republican Party kept throwing all these wishy-washy, half-baked uh, candidates, and they started calling me for donations, and I told them point blank, I said, I don't like your party. Because you're trying to push us Christians out. We're your base. And you're trying to push us out. I said, you want to win this next election? Make the Christians your friends. You will win this election. Praise God. That's exactly what happened. Okay, so that's God's role. God's role is to establish the king. What is the church's role? Well, we need to go to the New Testament. Turning your Bibles to 1 Timothy. Timothy was a young man who was discipled by Paul, the greatest apostle probably to ever live. Paul penned over two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul um, had, Timothy was like a son to Paul. And the more things change, the more they stay the same. One of the biggest problems with mankind is dealing with our government. I don't have to tell you, you know, how difficult it is to deal with the government. When the government wants its money, they want it pronto. When they owe you money, they can take their sweet time. Okay? If you don't get everything in by April 15th, unless you get the extension, you in big trouble. Right? So government has always been a problem for mankind. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm not a fool. Donald Trump is a sinner. Okay? Mike Pence is a sinner. But guess what? They're sinners saved by grace. Are they going to make mistakes? Yeah. They probably will. That's why they need our prayers. 
And you know what? While I'm at it, do you pray for your pastor? Because I'm a sinner saved by grace and I need your prayers. Because it gets difficult and lonely sometimes when you try to step out and serve God because the enemy doesn't like it and he will throw everything, including the kitchen sink, at you. And we see what has been thrown at this president. But in spite of that, he has accomplished 64% of his agenda in the first year. What does that translate? He's keeping his promises. Everything he ran on, he is doing. Amen. When, when have we ever had a politician like that? It's been a long time. A long, long time. But getting back to the church's role in America, what is our role? Well, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, gives us the clue. He says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that all that that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Let me ask you this question. Do you want to live a godly life in America? Yes. Amen. Do you want to live peacefully in America? Amen. Do you want to be prosperous in America? Amen. Do you want the gospel to, to ring through America? Amen. We, the church, must pray. In fact, look at what Paul says in verse 1. He says, first of all, that supplications. Okay? A supplication is you're pleading. Okay? You're, you're pleading on behalf of another. Of another. Intercession. Intercessions need to be made. Prayers need to be made. Supplications need to be made. In other words, pray, 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 pray. And when you think you've prayed enough, pray some more. Amen. Let me tell you something. I'll let you in on a little secret. I pray for the presidents. Since I've, you know, been politically aware, okay? More so for the last two presidents than any other group. And I want you to know something. I prayed against Barack Obama's policies daily because I believe that they were not of God. I believe that they were not in the best interest of our nation. I believe that it was his whole wanting to transform America to what? What do we want to transform America to? People want to come to this country to live. We got a, an invasion from the South where people want to come and move. In. So why do we need to transform the place where everyone else wants to come? What is the point to that? I'll tell you what the point of that was. Ego. Malice. Greed. A controlling spirit. And I praise God that God heard those prayers. Do you realize, and, and I know this is controversial, but I'm going to share it anyways, and I believe it's the prayers of God's people in America that stopped Barack Obama from accomplishing what Hitler accomplished. Do you realize that when Hitler ran for the chancellorship of Germany, that little kids in school sang songs about him? In America, when Barack Obama was running for president, little children were singing songs for him. You say, well... Big deal, Pastor. That's not a bad thing. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just singing songs. Well, let me continue. When Hitler was elected, and Hitler was elected, by the way. I want you to know something. Hitler was elected in Germany. And you know what the very first thing he did? Universal health care. Why? Because if you can control the people's doctors and their ability to get medicine, you have a lot of control. And we were lied to by that president. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. And you're, the average American family is gonna see a $2,500 deduction. Did it happen? Not a single one of those. They were all lies. And his, the architect of that, bragged about how dumb the American people were and that they needed to lie to get that through. That was the first thing. What was the second thing? The second thing that Hitler did was he mandated universal gun registry. And Barack Obama came this close. And once he had everyone's guns, everyone's guns registered, he then went through the country and demanded that those guns be turned over. And if you didn't turn them over, you were executed on the spot. And then he seized control and ended all elections. And if you don't think that can happen to America, you are foolish. Because one wise president said that liberty is always one generation away from dying.
What we have in America is unique because the God of America is unique. And if you don't believe me, I have a book I can show you the prayers and the thoughts and the comments of our founding fathers. They were Christians that believed in Jesus Christ and they promoted the gospel of Jesus Christ and they prayed for the country to be godly. And the first act of, of the Continental Congress was to print 10,000 Bibles to be distributed to churches, homes, and schools. So what you've been told by the revisionists that, oh, separation of church and state, first of all, it's not even in the Constitution. It's not there. It's unconstitutional. And you're saying, well, what, you want a church of the United States? No, I don't want one church dominating the political scene. That's, no. But I don't want the government dominating the church either. It's the church that should be influencing the government, not the government influencing the church. And that can only happen when we pray. Look at, that, look at verse 2. That these, that these prayers, intercessions, and supplications be made for who? For kings. Translate that today. That would be for our president. And all who are in authority, that means senators, governors, congressmen, um, mayors. mayors, whatever political office you can think of. We need to be praying for these people. Why? So that we can have a quiet peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Amen. Amen. Yes. So what is the role of the rulers in America? Well, let's drop down to verses 3 through 6. Okay? The role of the ruler is Excuse me, let's not go to that verse. The role of the rulers is to protect the interest and the life of our country. In, in America, we have a saying that we believe in the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That this is an, these are inalienable rights given to us by our Creator God. Not by the government. The government doesn't decide who gets to live and who dies. Well, guess what? They're trying. They're trying real hard. And it's wrong. And an abortion is it. Roe, versus w Roe v. Wade is unconstitutional. It was illegal. It was a law created by the judiciary branch. The judges aren't supposed to make laws in the land. That's the job of Congress. It's the job of the judges to rule whether a law is constitutional, but they subverted their constitutional priorities and they forced upon us a heinous crime. Do you realize that over 60 million American babies are murdered, have been murdered? To now it's closer to 70. I, my facts are old. Since Roe v. Wade. And yet we have the gall to point the finger at Stalin and Hitler and say how awful those people were, we've killed far more people in our abortion clinics than they ever did in all their purges and wars and wickedness. So we should pray that America would repent. And I'm telling you, this is what God said to Jeremiah. Okay? That thing that's in the womb is not tissue. That's a human being. Because you know what God said to Jeremiah? He said, before you were conceived in your mother's womb, I knew you. Amen. Amen. Those people have been murdered in the womb. Why? So that we can be promiscuous and have sex whenever we want, instead of having sex in the bonds of holy matrimony. That's the only, the marriage bed is supposed to be holy. Now, it's not the unforgivable sin. I'm not, I'm not condemning women who've had abortions. Jesus can forgive you. Okay? You can, you can have forgiveness. But, guy, but ladies, I'm telling you, I know people, I know women who've had abortions, and I know how scarred they are emotionally. How it's a very touchy subject. You know, and, 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 and not only that, you could become sterile. Okay? There's a lot of medical Issues for women that have abortions that women who don't have abortions don't face. See, God tells us not to do stuff for our own good. Amen. 
He puts boundaries in our lives. He gives us rulers. And it's the job of the rulers to protect the rights, to protect the life of their, of their citizens. And when our rulers fail, that's when the church needs to pray. And so I want to conclude with this. As we remember the fallen veterans and memorialize them today, and as we show the love of God, I'm calling the people of this congregation, remember this? These were prayer journals that were handed out in 2018. If you were here with us, some of, some of you might not have been with us in 2018. This is a 40-day prayer journal. This is something that, that I've been doing ever since 2015, when I first got this. I pray into this every single, well, sometimes, some days I miss, but I try to pray in every single day. I don't want to make false covenant here, okay? And I'm calling the people of this church to pray. Why? Because we have midterm elections coming. Yeah. And the opponents of our president have said if they gain power, they're going to impeach him. For what? Because they don't like him. You can't impeach someone because you don't like them. Okay? But that's what they're going to do. And they're going to try to stop everything that is happening in America today that is good. And, do you, and, and let me, just let me say this. So, Pastor, you're getting political. You're being all right wing. How dare you do that in the pulpit? Well, guess what? I have the right as a pastor to be all right wing. And in fact, this president has, been, has removed the executive order that says pa pastors can't preach politics in the, in the podium without fearing to lose their tax-exempt status. You know what? The church has always been tax-exempt. That was a, a law that was hoisted upon us by a left-wing president. Okay? And I, this president has removed that. And not only has he removed that, but he has a council that's working together with evangelical Christians to expand religious freedom in America. Go figure! We need religious freedom expand in America? I thought this was the land of the free. Home of the brave. Well, guess what? It was becoming the land of the oppressed and the home of the fearful. And I believe that God wants us to pray for this country. Amen. To pray for this town. This town, this town needs Jesus. Amen. These people who aren't here today, who don't believe in Jesus Christ, they're going to burn in hell. If they die today, they're going to go to hell. That's right. Do we care about that? Yes. Do we want them to be saved? Yes. Then we need to pray. Amen. Yes. We, need to, we need to show the love of God. And, and we're going to make mistakes. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But you know what? You know what? One of the best examples for us to show them that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus said in John 13, 35, he said, and they, talking about the world, and they will know that you are my disciples by your love that you have one for another. We need to love one another. We need to pray for one another. We need to pray for our president. If you don't agree with this president, then pray that God will change his mind. Or pray that God stops his policies. You can do that. Amen. That's not wickedness. That's being a good steward of what God has given to us. This incredible free country. So let's, let's close in a word of prayer, shall we? Father, my prayer is that the United States of America in 2018 would experience a revival like she has never had before. Lord, we have a president who says he wants to make America great again. The only way America can be great again is if America is godly again. So we pray that you would make America as a whole godly again. Lord, I know that we're sinful. I know sometimes we, we serve our own interests. Even we Christians do that. But Lord, your word says in John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, the job of the rulers of this country is to protect the lives of Americans and the prosperity of this nation. Lord, the job of the church is to pray for the leaders and for the country. And Lord, we know what your, your role is. You are the one that will have the glory. You are the one that will establish kings. You are the one that removes kings. You are the great God. 
the Alpha and Omega. And Lord, we just praise you for that. And so we ask that what Satan has meant for evil with all this dissension that's been going on since 2016, that you would turn it around for your glory, that you would unite America once again, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you're a listener who doesn't know Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're not born again of God's Spirit, today's the day of salvation. Jesus could come back right now, and if he were to come back right now, and if you're not saved, you're going to get left behind, and you're going to have to meet the most horrible person this world has ever seen, the Antichrist. We at First Congregational Church don't want that to happen to you. And so we ask you, come to Jesus. Accept him into your heart. And if you would just pray this real simple prayer with me, you can punch your ticket for the rapture on Airline Jesus. So just pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to cleanse me from my iniquities. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior. I surrender to you. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that for the first time, happy birthday. Today truly was your day of salvation. One, one last favor I ask of you. If you could just go and tell a Bible preaching pastor or friend, someone you trust, what you did. Tell them how you accepted Christ into your heart. Because there's something about speaking out what we do that builds up our faith in Jesus. Well, from, from the rest of us at First Congregational Church, we'll see you next week, and may God bless you all the days of your life.